Hello and uh, welcome to the question and answer session for the um, Primary Science Getting Started MOOC. Um, we have three questions to go through with you today. The first one has come in from Jasmine, who ha has asked um, what we would recommend for teaching primary science to a trainee teacher. Uh, what are the key vocabularies that we might want to, to go through with the children? Um, and where would we find a glossary for science? And what resources would we recommend? Um, so I'm going to answer a little bit of this question, actually, then Karen's going to take over and do a little bit about vocabulary for you. So as a trainee teacher, um, one of the key things to do is to really make sure that you are asking if you can actually do some delivery of science in use placement schools. Um, at the moment, under restrictions, that can be a little bit more difficult. I do realise that. But it is a core subject. And so it is something that you really do need to have that experience of teaching within the school. And actually having your mentors around who can, can help you with that, because it's uh, the, the, the pedagogy that we might use for actually teaching science is a little bit different than it is in other subjects so it's something that without doing it you won't build your confidence up now even if that's just a, a session or whether you get to do a science day or hopefully you'd manage to take part in a science topic that's ongoing at school anyway the other thing that I would recommend is that you make sure that you have that really good subject knowledge of the topics that you are teaching. You know, it's 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 been written time and time again that uh, you know primary teachers are not always experts in science, but actually to teach it well, we need to be really confident with that subject knowledge. And there are loads of things out there that can really help us with that. Um, on here, on the FutureLearn platform and through STEM Learning, there are actually some courses that uh, that we've written that can help you with uh, with biology, chemistry, and physics for primary science. And they're available. Well, we've got physics and chemistry that are available now, and then the biology is going to be released very, very soon. So keep your eyes out for that one as well. There's actually three parts to the the biology. There's going to be um, a, a a classification one, there's going to be one about um, the human body um, and one about evolution and inheritance. So that's going to give you lots and lots of information that will help you with your teaching. If you're wanting something a little bit more specific, there are lots of books out there that talk you through the subject knowledge. And there's also uh, Reach Out CPD, which, which does it topic by topic as well. Um, you also need to make sure that when you are doing your planning, that as well as teaching the subject knowledge, you are embedding the working scientifically. And you need to be doing that very carefully to make sure that that, uh, that, that practical work that you are planning in actually does have meaning, that it's not just a standalone task that actually the children just get excited about because it's a, a practical task. You need to be making sure that it is something that the children are actually learning something from. And again, there is lots of things out there that can help us, that can help you with that, which I'll go over very shortly with you. Also, when you're planning, um, do consider the misconceptions that children might have. Um, this is really important because without picking up those misconceptions, the children's learning is never going to progress. You need to make sure that you are uh, assessing the children to make sure that they haven't got them. And if they have, that you are tackling those misconceptions. So some of the resources that can help us with this, well, the main one that we're going to recommend is actually our website. So on the STEM Learning website, we have a wealth of resources that will help um, any teacher, including student teachers out there. If you go to the resources section, we have curated resources for all the topics within the primary science. Um, and you'll, you'll find loads and loads of ideas for both knowledge based and your practical work on there. There is also a really useful section that you could start using now and for your NQT year, which is um, another, another collection on there about uh, teacher standards and being able to reach those teacher standards. And it's a really good one to give you some ideas of how to do that in the future. Other really good resources that will help you. Um, this is one of my personal faves. And actually, if this, this is one that I wish had been around when I was teaching. Um, and these are the plan knowledge matrices for each of the year groups. And in these packs, which you can, can download online, um, it gives you loads of information. So you've got uh, the knowledge that the children should be coming up with. You've got where they go next. You've got ideas for how to cover those topics, the expectations that are needed in there. Um, there's a little bit about vocabulary as well. Um, there's loads of stuff 
that will help you. Oh, the misconceptions are covered in there as well. Um, just to make sure that you, you've got your working scientifically definitely there. Ogden Trust also to produce some really nice crib sheets for working scientifically, which again also gives some really nice examples of um, ideas for, for questions that you could be doing for each of the different inquiry types. Um, to really help with the planning, there's some really good books out of there. Again, one of my personal favourites is this one, um, A Creative Approach for Teaching uh, Science. This is by Nikki Waller. Um, I really like this one because it's got every statement within the curriculum and a practical idea that you could do alongside that. Um, but again, you need, do need to make sure that when you are running that practical activity, that you are ensuring that the children have got uh, the learning happening there as well. It's not just that exciting activity. OK, so um, just picking up on Jasmine's other point, she asked about um, what what's the key vocabulary? Um, where can you find um, that? And what you know, what what which words and things and skills would you share with with the children? Um, well, the first place to go for the key vocabulary is obviously the national curriculum. It's all in there, you know, all the words that you should be doing. It's usually at the bottom um, after you've read all the, the learning objectives. There tends to be you know, the sorts of words that you might want to be covering. But um, recently, the Welcome Trust, through their Explorify um, toolkit, they put together every single word that appears in the um, British national curriculum. So you can go into there. So if you go to the Explorify website um, and just click on the top that it says toolkit, you'll find the vocabulary resources there. And so it'll start with year one and it'll say, you know, what words should you be maybe covering with your year one children? Um, and it's it's a massive list of words. Um, and then once you've sort of found the words that you want to, there's so many different ways that you can do them with the children, teach them, um, play games with them. Um, there's a wonderful book called Jump, Jump Start, which is about literacy um, activities to embed science learning. Um, and there's some great games in there. Um, what I used to use, which we used to find really good, was um, when we're looking at new vocabulary. So, for example, a new topic like forces has a lot of words that, you know, some have meanings other meanings in english um for example wait you know um wait i'm waiting for a train or you know how, you know my weight is and things like that then there's the confusion with math so many confusing words um and what i'd get the children to do is write you know, we'd have a, a list of all the words that we might be in, uh, encountering in that topic and then ask the children to write down next to it or talk with their partner what do they think those words meant so, um, you know, for example, force, what do they think it means? Then I might ask them to do some work around it or um, do a dictionary hunt or, or anything like that or, or just throughout the topic. Um, and then at the end of the topic, get them to have a, a look back at those words that they, they uh, looked at at the beginning of the topic and see, do their definitions change? Do they have a better understanding of them or were they right in the first place? And it's just a nice way of sort of going, oh, this is what I thought it meant. And at the end of my topic, I've got a better understanding maybe of that word. Bit of assessment for you. You can say, oh, yeah, that child or that one needs a bit more support. Um, there's lovely games like um, where you, you play bingo and maybe you say the definition and if the child's got it on their grid, they slap it. Um, displays of words that the children use you know if a child uses a brilliant word a uh, brilliant use of science uh, piece of science vocabulary pop it up on the wall let's celebrate it you know so and so she said this today and, and it's brilliant can they use it in a sentence you know when you're doing your literacy work um have it as a science focus um i used to send home we had to do weekly spellings i don't know if that's something that goes on in your school but there would be a science words that maybe they might struggle with and the children would have to work out what the definition was or we'd work it out together uh, and then practice it. Um, lots of schools I know have uh, lab coats or white shirts and they write words all over them and the children have to learn them. There's so many different ways of practicing that vocabulary, but probably the best way is just using it in class, getting the children, if, they, if they're if they explaining something to you or asking a question, if they use the wrong word or if they don't use the science vocabulary, is give it to them. Um, I taught uh, reception children they loved big words they loved it, learning what they were and using them um so yeah so the vocabulary it's a great thing to do play around with lots of fun things but it's sort of making sure that the children are using them um when they're when they're talking to you in class 
The second question that we had was from Thomas, who's asked that uh, practical science helps to make the subject come alive for learners. But the topic of Earth and Space, that is in part of the English Science National Curriculum for Year 5, asks teachers to describe concepts like planetary movements that we cannot physically show them. And have we got any tips to help make this topic more practical? Well, I will try as hard as I can with this one, Thomas, um, because actually this topic is a favourite uh, with the children out there. It's, it's an actually fascinating topic for them and it engages them um, throughout However, I can understand your reservations with it because it is one that that d does seem to make practical work um, less obvious. It's, it's one that uh, many teachers struggle with when it comes to that working scientifically and trying to fit in their inquiry types. And much of that is because we can't use real objects for this or we, we can't use most of the real objects for this. And the sizes and, um, and differences between the objects that we're talking about are absolutely impossible to work with or for children to understand at times. Um, but it's worth remembering that in the national curriculum, we have five types of inquiry and actually some of them are just not suitable for this topic. So things like comparative and fair testing, we might not be using those as much to teach the statements that are within the national curriculum. Although in saying that, there's some really nice add-ons uh, that you can do for this that, that do cover those inquiry types. But things like research, pattern seeking, um, identifying, classifying and grouping can all be done um, brilliantly with this topic. Uh, and it's those that I'd probably focus your work around and you're working scientifically around within this topic. You also need to understand that for this, we are going to have to use models as much as we want to use real life objects as much as possible. As I've already mentioned, it's not possible within this topic. Um, so you are going to have to use models. We just need to make sure that we're doing it carefully and that we're thinking about any misconceptions that children might get um, through through using those models. Um, and we, we tackle that with the children. So we might talk to them about the fact that this isn't a perfect example, this isn't a perfect model because, and make sure that they understand uh, that side of it. Um, so when you are teaching planetary movements, um, one of the best and, and most practical ways that you can do that is actually to get the children to maybe research what, what the planetary movements are beforehand, uh, get them to have a good idea of, of that, and then build that in with your teaching so that you are making sure that they understand that perfectly. And then actually getting them to model it and that'll help to embed that, that information. Uh, and that modeling could be through the children actually role playing those planetary movements actually doing that in a big space. So take them outside, use the playground, use chalk so you could actually be drawing out the orbits. You know, there's all sorts of stuff you can do. In terms of making it seem a little bit more real, you could get them to hold objects. So it could be balls. Um, there's a lovely... Um, there's a lovely idea about making a, a fruit solar system. Um, and the idea of that is using fruits for different scales, of the different planets. So you could actually be getting the children to, to role play some of this using some of those fruits. So they've actually got to the fruits and or vegetables. Uh, so they've got the right set, sort of scaled size objects for what they're working on. Now, there's a wealth of ideas and resources actually for space that's on our website and it's part of the, the SRO UK pages uh, that, again, you'll find under the curated resources. And, and they are fab. There is all sorts of stuff on there and plenty for primary science and lots that will fit uh, with that earth and space topic. So I hope that's helped you, Thomas. The final question came from Saqib um, and he um, is studying uh, primary school. Uh, teaching at university and he just asked so he loves to sit watching practical work um, you know he thinks it's a really important part of the curriculum which obviously it is um, but he was wondering what sorts of things would we recommend he looks out for when he's observing a science lesson taught by his mentor um, it's a brilliant question because quite often when I've worked with trainee teachers or NQTs they say I don't know how you manage that science lesson science lessons can look you know, so busy and the children, you know, are engaged to something else. They're not quite often sat watching you as a teacher. They're, you know, engaged on their own. They're doing different things. There might be one group doing some practical work, another group researching. There might be lots of activity going on. And as a, um, an, a person who's new to the profession, it can look a bit chaotic. And you're like, goodness me, I don't know how you're managing to control that. 
I think what I would suggest is if you get the opportunity and hopefully you do to observe science and lots of science is one, watch how the teacher manages practical work. How do they set up their groups? Um, how do they ask the children to work? So are the children given roles? which is a really nice way of making sure that all the children are engaged. So if you've got a group of four children, you don't have one or two sat out doing nothing. They, they have something that they're, that they're in charge of. Um, do the children get their own resources? How does the teacher manage that? So are the resources in a central place? Do the children know where they are? Um, what routines has the teacher put in place to ensure that practical work is fluid and that the children are engaged and are, are learning. Um, how does the teacher ask the children questions and how do the children ask the teacher questions? Because part of the national curriculum is that we remove our support the older the children get. So, you know, if you're in a key stage one class, so those very young children, the, the teacher might be giving much more support and might be structuring what the children are busy doing. But by the time they get to the top of the primary age, so 10 and 11 year old, the children really should be asking their own questions and making their own decisions about resources and equipment and, and how they're going to progress and recording. So is the teacher allowing the children to, to ask those questions and how do they um, lead the children to asking the right questions so, and it's quite a skill and so if you can watch that and take notes of how the teacher actually gets the children to engage with the, with them um other things is how is the teacher eliciting what the children understand so sarah talks quite a bit about you know misconceptions and making sure that you address them how is the teacher elicited that the children have those um, that is part of as, as sarah mentioned our future learn courses on the subject knowledge is we talk a lot about how do we know what the children have got have got misunderstandings around? Um, and does the teacher then address those? Or, does, or, or do they let them sort of go on? Um, you know, it's really important that we do address them. But sometimes it might be that the teacher addresses them when the child says it. Or it might be, oh, that's interesting. Let's do our practical work. Let's do our investigation. Do we still have that same misconception at the end? Um so it might not be addressed right at, at the point because sometimes you want the children to go, oh, oh, that's not what I thought it was, you know. So, so that's quite a skill in itself to not go, you know, when a child says, um, I, I can't think of anything, you know, that the, the, um, the something that you just go in sleep. Well, that's not right. Sometimes it's nice to let the children find that answer out themselves, and a and a good science teacher will often allow that to happen as long as it's addressed before the children then leave the classroom because you don't want to cement those misconceptions. Um, I would suggest just watch as many science lessons as you can and try to gather um, all the good things that you see um, and, and start to sort of embed them and think about, you know, a, a lot of teachers, very experienced teachers, do struggle with, with managing um, children when they're not working, you know, just sat at a desk. But it, it's, it's really important that they do have that opportunity to work as groups, work in pairs, work, um, you know, uh, embed those working scientifically skills that they can only do through practical work and being uh, allowed that little bit more freedom. Well, thank you very much for joining both myself and Karen on the question and answer session. Um, we hope that uh, it's been helpful for you just as the course has been. And, uh, and we hope we'll see you again, um, either online on one of our other courses or perhaps even at the National Centre or through one of our uh, science learning partners across the country. Thanks very much. <laughs>